the Monday morning uh, meeting of the House Appropriations Committee. And we have a couple of things on our agenda today. We'll have a full day of work, but first we're going to hear from Susanna Davis, who is with us from the Office of the Administration. Uh, welcome, Susanna. And um, would you uh, tell us your, your formal title? I, I have the Director of um, uh, Equity and, and Diversity, but I, I want to make sure that we have your correct title. Of course, it's the Executive Director of Racial Equity. Well, I was I was not close enough, but thank you very much. And I should know the tight your your title. I just don't have my agenda, and I don't have your PowerPoint because I ran out of ink. And I've been you know how you use it for a long time on a shoestring. Well, it finally printed everything, well, you know, with nothing. So I apologize. So welcome, Susanna. It, it's a pleasure to have you here today. And uh, within the governor's uh, recommended budget, there there was a provision. Um, for a $2 million expenditure um, to, lead, uh, to address Vermonters who were left behind with the federal stimulus of $1,200, um, a single payment, as well as uh, the one payment per child of $500. And um, we uh, asked to schedule you in so that we could fully understand uh, the provision and how it would work for Vermont. And and um, what and how you thought we could actually roll it out. So I want to welcome you to the committee today. I think Teresa has um, your documents so that we can put them up on the screen. And um, I'm going to, um, you know, you haven't been before our committee, and I haven't met you personally. And I'm Kitty Toll. I'm the chair of the committee, and I would like to go. Uh, to my left, which would start with Peter. And if you think about where you are around the table, because our Hollywood squares are all different, would the committee members like to introduce <laughs> them? This is your first time um, coming to our committee, I believe. So Peter this, and- no. Susanna, good morning. Thank you for coming in. I'm Peter Fagan. I am from Rutland City. And I guess I'm next going around the table. Good morning, uh, Maida Townsend from South Burlington. Unmute myself. And good morning, I'm Marty Feltis. I oh, think I missed- sorry, that. Diane's next. That's, that's okay, I didn't, I was in the struggling with unmuting myself. I'm representative Diane Lanfer, I live in Virgin. We haven't been in the committee room. And for I'm representative- <laughs> Right. We forget where we sit. <laughs> I'm Representative Marty Feltis. I live in Linden and I cover the towns of Linden, Sutton and Burke in the Northeast Kingdom. Welcome. Well, they don't let us out often. So this is a... my, my name is Dave <laughs> Iacovoni. I'm from Morrisville. I represent Elmore, Worcester, Morristown and Woodbury. Pleased to meet you. Good morning. My name is Linda Myers. I represent the town of Essex in Chittenden County. Welcome. Hi, my name is Kimberly Jessup and I represent East Mount Pillar and Middlesex. Yes, ma'am. My name is Representative Bob Helm and I'm from Fairhaven representing four towns right here on the New York State border. But Bob jumped ahead of me because I was having trouble unmuting too. Um, I'm Chip Conquest. I represent Newberry, Groton, and Thompson. Uh, Hi. Oh, Mary, I forgot. I thought we were yeah. around the table. <laughs> no, the person no. who usually holds your... <laughs> um, hi, uh, Susanna. I am Mary Hooper. I represent Montpelier. Uh, Mary doesn't usually hold my hand. She usually kicks my shin until it's black <laughs> and blue. <laughs> I, I started to say that and I thought, oh no, this is really inappropriate, don't. <laughs> so, so welcome. And Susanna, the towns that I represent are Danville, Cabot, and Peachum. And we're very pleased to have you here today. And um, we, uh, we would like to learn more about the position and exact, uh, the initiative, not the position, the initiative, and exactly what the administration had in mind. And um, we are thinking about, instead of leaving this in the budget, perhaps moving it as a separate bill and, um, and, you know, and look forward to working with you in a partnership to see what this would look like. So welcome 
Yes, Teresa, put the documents up and I'm going to turn Dana, it over. Do you to want you. the current testimony I received from Catherine Russell this morning or do you want the fact sheet? Susanna, what would you like to work from first? The testimony that was sent over this morning is the uh, formal testimony from the racial equity advisory panel. That's the advisory panel that works alongside the person in my role. Uh, I do urge you all to review it if um, if you don't, I mean, I'm happy to read it to you or you could read it yourself today. Um, it will likely be touching on similar points that we make in our conversation today. So if you'd like to um, review that at another time, that would be fine. The fact sheet is a little bit more concise um, and is perhaps, I think it's bullet pointed if I recall correctly. So as a working document, the fact sheet would be good, but I do urge you all to review the, the testimony. Thank you, and we will do that. Okay, so some of you may have this printed and others of you just work from the screen. And Susanna, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, so you've summarized it accurately, Madam Chair. This is a proposal to provide economic stimulus payments akin to the ones that were provided through the Federal CARES Act. But these payments would specifically be geared toward Vermonters who were excluded from Federal CARES Act economic stimulus payments due to their or someone else's immigration status. The reason that this is so important, just from the perspective of morality, is because all of us in this country and in this state have been hit very hard by the pandemic. And so as we talk about the humanity of this crisis and, and all of us in this crisis, the deliberate and really surgical exclusion of certain people because of things like immigration holdups um, is, is a highly questionable act from a moral and an ethical perspective. And then from a fiscal perspective, I mean, there is absolutely a business case for this proposal as well. After all, the state of Vermont relies heavily on industries that are bolstered by the labor of exactly the groups who were excluded from the federal stimulus payment. So us stepping in where the federal government fell short allows us to bring forward all Vermonters to move out of this crisis together um, and allows us to help keep people afloat who are in just as much need, if not more, than the rest of us who did have access to a number of federally funded services and lifelines. Now, I know that uh, each of you might have familiarity with this proposal to varying degrees, or you may have technical questions. So if it's all right with you, I'd like to ask you all, um, are there any points about this proposal that are unclear on their face that I can elaborate on? If not, I could just do a quick, I could just continue walking through it. Let's do the quick walkthrough. And then I think uh, that may clarify some questions and then do the questions after you uh, do, do this high level sheet. You got it. So we've discussed the purpose of the proposal. Um, now, what does this actually look like? How many people could it serve? Well, you're seeing on the screen a breakdown in that, in that table that shows a total of about 5,000 Vermonters who could be eligible. Now, this number was arrived at using best estimates from a number of sources, including U.S. Census Bureau data, UVM, UVM Extension, and Pew, and a couple others, uh, think tank research houses, and um, organizations on the ground in the, with these communities like Migrant Justice in Vermont. So we estimate up to 5,000 Vermonters who would be eligible. That breaks down to 4,000 adults and 1,000 children. Now, of those people, it's really important to note that this is widely viewed and commonly referred to as an undocumented immigrant relief fund, and that is the bulk of the people who are intended beneficiaries. However, this is also something that ensnares U.S. citizens, people who are, who are American, people who are here with lawful status and who may pay taxes here. <clears throat> and the reason for that is the CARES Act explicitly tried to exclude undocumented persons from receiving stimulus payments. But the way they did that was by using social security number as a proxy for legal status. In other words, they presumed that if you don't have a social security number, 
you are likely, you are more likely to be here unlawfully. And so what that ends up doing is also catching in that net a lot of people who are lawfully present or in fact who were born here who don't use social security numbers for whatever reason or who are affiliated with someone who doesn't use a social security number. So a lot of US citizens, many of whom are children, um, have also been barred from receiving these economic stimulus payments. And actually the Vermont State Tax Department has confirmed at a couple hundred, almost 300 at least, filers uh, for the 2019 tax year who did file taxes, but who would have been excluded from the CARES Act economic stimulus payments due to the social security number provision. And I'm gonna ask Teresa, if you don't mind, if you could just scroll a bit for me, uh, just to make sure that I got everything. There's a bit of technical information for those of you who really wanna get into the weeds of how the CARES Act uh, was able to do that. It lists the specific provisions. Um, that's about it, that's, that's the overview. Okay, um, let's open it up to questions. If we can um, go back to the full screen. Thank you, Teresa. And are there questions um, for Susanna regarding the, the administration's proposal? Uh, Bob? Yeah, so my question is two, two questions. How do you not use a social security number and get paid by somebody? And mm -hmm. how can that happen? Yeah, so um, there are a number of categories of people. Well, so first of all, everyone born in the United States is assigned a social security number. And many people who immigrate to the United States also receive social security numbers. But there are many people who immigrate lawfully to the US who don't have social security numbers. And there are also a lot of people who do not immigrate at all to the US, but for whatever reason, they might do business in or work in the US. And so they're assigned a tax ID number, but not a social security number because they don't intend to reside in the US or right. to um, take citizenship. So there are a number of different ways that you could file or be present or receive a check or work here, but not have a social security number. The bulk of it is people who are working under the table people whose employers have an agreement with them that they're, they're paid through means that allow them to work without social security numbers in that documentation. But there's also a large subset of people who file with what's called an individual tax identification number, an ITIN. The ITIN is assigned by the IRS. It is assigned regardless of immigration status and its sole purpose is for tax filing identification. So for example, you could be someone who's legally present in the US um, and you file taxes using an ITIN, but you don't have an SSN because you don't really, you're not trying to live here, you're not trying to be a citizen, you just work here. And there are okay. also a couple of other categories, I apologize, I just, um, there are also a couple of other categories like folks who uh, maybe don't work here, but they are dependents or spouses and they're claimed by somebody who does, in which case they may not have a social security number but they're also accounted for. All right, and that brings me to my second question. So, and that was, how do you, if they're undocumented, my question was, if they're undocumented, how do you have addresses and contact information? And I guess, I think you might've just answered that through these other forms of being involved with the government, right? I mean, but if you're getting paid under the table, you, government has no record of that person. It, that is correct, right? When I say under I, the table, that's cash. Yeah, I would say that's probably generally true. I mean, there are a lot of people who are American citizens who get paid under the table and government has record of them to some degree. So I don't know if I would, if I would say that categorically, but I think and, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think what you're getting at is how do we know who to send payment to if we don't right. know where people are in the state? Right. Okay, so what I would say there is there are a number of ways that we can do that. Number one, there are a lot of uh, people who would be beneficiaries here who work on farms. Many of them also live on those farms. And so their employers have close contact with them and are able 
to um, to identify who they are and, and a lot of other folks who would be recipients here have addresses and live in the state. Uh, they just, for whatever reason, don't have social security numbers or may not interact with the IRS in the same way that the rest of us do. The other thing is that in order to identify who people are, who in order to pay them, we've devised a, a process that would include an application so that folks would present to us and certify their eligibility, and then we would uh, disperse payment. All right, and then just just if I may, just one more. Um, so if you're paid in Vermont and you live in New York, New Hampshire, or Massachusetts, the check would be sent to other states, correct? A requirement of receiving this proposed payment is that you be a resident of Vermont. Okay, we have a lot of border people that cross over. I don't know a lot, but there are some that cross over every day um, that then would not qualify. Is what that's you just true. said, right? Yeah. That's true. And that's why we also would urge our um, neighbor states to implement a similar program so that if they have residents of New York or Mass or New Hampshire, who also um, should qualify for these kinds of payments that they can administer that program through their coffers. Right, well, who knows whether they're doing that or not, but you know, we've got our own problems. <laughs> but anyways, okay, well, thank you very much, ma'am. You've been very helpful. Thank you, Bob. Um, Marty and then Mary. Yes, good morning again. Uh, my, my only question so far is, in the program that the federal government administered through the CARES Act to U.S. residents that did have social security numbers, there was an income limit applied to those. Not everybody obviously received that payment. Would that apply as well to this program? We hadn't necessarily worked to that. First of all, I have to apologize for the background noise, this is the point at which a very large truck decides to uh, be outside my window. So I'm sorry for the noise. Um, we hadn't necessarily built that in just yet because what we found is that nearly everyone who would qualify for these payments does not meet the threshold that would have resulted in prorating of their amount. So there was an income limit of $75,000 in order for an adult to receive that $1,200 from the federal government. It is then reduced proportionately based on how many thousands of dollars over that 75 the person's income was. So that by the time you reach $99,000 right. per person or $198,000 per couple, you receive no payment. And the likelihood that a Vermont resident who has no social, secu social security number is making $75,000 or more is, is very low. But to your point, Representative, it is something that, that could be baked into the program just to ensure, again, that parity. Because you know, the proposal is not designed to get anything right. more than what other residents uh, were, were entitled to under the Fed. Oh, I understand that, uh, certainly. And I, I also understand that the likelihood of this population exceeding that amount is, is not very likely. However, if we're trying to uh, duplicate the other program that went out the door, I think we need to keep that in mind as well. Absolutely. That's an excellent point. Thank you for that. Thank you, Marty. Mm -hmm. I have and then, oops, did I cut you off, Susanna? Were you saying? Oh, um, thank you, Marty. And I have Mary, uh, Chip, and then Kimberly. Hi. I, I need some um, word, a, a description of some of the people who are eligible or not eligible. So if I am holding a green card, I, and I, I don't know if I pay social security or not, and maybe, so if I have a green card, was I excluded from this? If you have a green card, you are a legal permanent resident. Mm -hmm. You are not excluded. Okay. Um, and then if I am not a legal permanent resident, but my child is, um, so is there, I mean, was born in the United States, 
therefore is a citizen, that child did not receive the payment because of my parent, but because of my status? Do I? Correct. All mixed status families were categorically excluded. Yeah. So even though, you know, there could be five people in a family, one of the earners in the family was excluded, everybody ended up being excluded. Is that correct? correct? Yeah. And then can you talk a little bit about, I, I understand that you have a strategy for allocating these payments. Certainly there is going to be a good deal of fear about making oneself known can you, uh, in, to the government, regardless of our intentions. Can, can you talk about how you're going to protect the status of people, um, period? Yeah, trust is a huge factor here. And it's not just for the population of people who, are, who have questionable immigration status. It's also for all historically marginalized people who have ever been done wrong by the US government. And let me tell you, that is a long list. So in thinking about how we administer this program, it's really important that we keep that in mind. And so one of the things that is absolutely paramount is that we be able to work with community organizations who are on the ground, who have established trusting relationships with these communities so that those groups can, if you will, vouch for the state um, to those members of the public who may be afraid of coming forward. Another big aspect is making the application minimally invasive. That is to say, asking only the questions that are probative enough to facilitate payment and nothing beyond that scope. If we don't need it for the purpose of this program, we don't have to ask it. Another thing that we can do is to, well, another question that, that came up was um, which agencies or departments or entities would be administering these funds. There are some agencies that have closer contacts with vulnerable populations who may be better suited to that. And we're still working through the details of what this could look like who has the capacity in state government to run this kind of a program and what we think will yield the most positive and trusting interaction with the public. But I will say this is, a, this is one step on a long road of trust building that the state wants to do with these communities to ensure that people know that we're here to serve them. We're not here to sell them out to the feds Policy in Washington is not the same as Susanna, policy in Vermont. Did, hear you? did, ever, did anyone else lose, lose nope. uh, your voice? Just, my, just mine, I'm sorry. My, my connection's unstable, I apologize. I think everyone's connection is unstable, both figuratively and literally these days. <laughs> Um, I, I was saying that, you know, Washington policy is different than Vermont policy. And so us being able to demonstrate to Vermonters who are here, we're here for you and we're not, we're not proxies for a federal admin that has inconsistent views on whether you're a person or not is, is key. That's a wonderful statement. And I know that we want that to be true. Um, I think we also all worry about maintaining, holding that up. Do you have a sense of what percentage of folks um, are likely not to, so you, you've done your best, it looks like a good estimate of who may be eligible, but what number of folks, what percent of folks may not have that confidence in the system and step up? There's really no way to know. I mean. In that estimate of 5,000 people, we have estimated um, up to 500 citizens and legal permanent residents, that's green card holders, who did file taxes. Well, no, I apologize. We identified somewhere between 295 and maybe up to 500 uh, citizens and legal permanent residents in Vermont who filed, but who would have been ineligible because they filed jointly with a spouse who doesn't have an SSN or for some reason like that. So I imagine that group of people will be happy to forward applications because they're already here and they're citizens and LPRs already. So I imagine that group will probably come forward um, almost in its entirety. 
We've also identified up to 500 immigrants who are here in Vermont with lawful status, but who don't have social security numbers. And that includes people on student visas, spouses or dependents of people, uh, citizens who petitioned for them to come to the US, asylum applicants who've received asylum, but who have not yet received their work authorizations. So those, that might be another chunk of people who are likely to come forward because they are here with legal status. But for everyone else, it's, it's so difficult to know. Thank you, Mary. Um, Chip and then uh, Kimberly. Uh, thank you. Um, Mary asked a number of the questions I was going to. Um, but I have a couple more. Um, is, is the social security number, um, the lack of it, the, the only thing in the federal program that explicitly excludes um, folks, the folks who didn't get it? I mean, was there anything else in that, in the, the requirements or the, the legislation that, that specifically uh, keeps people from being able to get the payment. Do you mean that specifically keeps anyone or specifically keeps um, immigrants from being able to get it? Well, the, the folks that we're trying to um, find a way to serve here. Yeah, so there's um, so one provision is that you have to have filed 2018 or 2019 taxes with a social security number. Um, but there's another provision that expressly bars quote, non-resident aliens from receiving the, the stimulus payments. And interestingly, non-resident alien is not defined in immigration law, it's defined in the Internal Revenue Code. And it's defined as a person who is not a US citizen or a US national, and who has not passed the green card test or the substantive presence test. So those are two, two tests to, uh, that, to determine whether a person has an established presence here. Um, and so a non-resident alien is a person who's not a citizen or a national and hasn't gone through either of those processes. And then separately, it also states, you have to have filed with an SSN. Okay. Um, and then for those people who um, have something I had never heard of before, the individual tax ID number, the ITIN. Um, are, are many of the um, uh, undocumented workers, um, are, they, are taxes being withheld when they're getting paid um, through the use of something like the ITIN? Some uh, may be using iTunes to file taxes. However, the majority are not, and yet the majority in Vermont are still having taxes withheld because they do receive paychecks and pay stubs. And so payroll taxes are being withheld. So they're paying into the, the tax coffers, but they don't get to file returns and take advantage of any of the programs they pay into. I guess that's what I was trying to get at. So how how are employers, um, I, I guess, I'm just wondering how that how you're um, creating a, a payroll tax ID or something for an employee if that employee doesn't have a social security number or an ITIN or anything else? You know, I, I could probably speculate, but I, I don't think I'd be comfortable doing that because I'm sure it really runs the gamut how different employers do that. I guess and really I don't. The, sorry. Um, I, I guess really the, the issue is, do we have any um, evidence or knowledge that um, despite the fact that there may be various ways they're going about it, they may not be, uh, well, they, that, that these folks are, the payroll taxes are being held, withheld. And do we know sort of, is that pretty universal or do we have any knowledge about that? It's not universal, but my understanding is that many undocumented workers in Vermont do receive and could present a pay stub that shows payroll taxes being taken out. 
Okay. I would, I would hesitate to recommend that as a part, as a requisite part of an application, because many still don't uh, have that ability. But yes, it, technically it, it can be proven as far as I understand. Yeah, my, my questioning is really trying to anticipate some questioning that we will, um, that this program will get when it's presented and just trying to you know if we have any answers. Um, and then lastly, I think for now, um, so in a, in a mixed status family, um, in terms of immigration status anyway, uh, uh, so if, if, let's say the, the, the wife is um, and a married couple, the wife uh, is a legal resident and the husband is not, did and could the wife receive the stimulus payment just for herself and she had a presumably had a social security number? If they filed jointly as spouses, then no. Okay. And if they filed single or separately, I believe not. Um, mixed status family, basically, if you're connected to a person who doesn't have a social security number, the CARES Act cuts you out. And I want to make, I want to make one point that I think a lot of people miss, which is that when you have someone who's in the country legally, or maybe was born here as a citizen, and you marry a person from overseas, and you're, you're working on that, getting that person legal status, the first thing that any good immigration lawyer will tell you is, you should be commingling funds and filing taxes jointly because it helps to establish that that person has a presence in the United States. And so now all of that sound legal advice that helps to build a case for citizenship is now being used against those people because they've been filing taxes jointly as instructed and that joint filing is what cuts mm -hmm. the legal citizen spouse out of receiving CARES Act money. Thank you. Thank you, Chip. Um, uh, Kimberly? Yeah. Hi, Susanna. Thank you, first of all, for taking this on. I think it's super important. Um, the issue that I have concerns the timeline for standing this up. And the reason I'm asking about the timeline, and I know it's a heavy lift and it depends, of course, on funding, is how many departments across government may possibly be involved. And I know in the past that there have been challenges, for example, around the driver privilege card. And so if one was trying to stand up a program like this and it involved multiple agencies, um, I'm just wondering if there's been any thought at this point in time that you care to share about whether, for example, the Agency of Human Services might take the lead versus tax because of potential complications. Thanks. You know, thank you for the question. We're working that out, but I would say, and I, of course I don't speak on, on the governor's behalf, but I speculate that he might agree that minimizing the web of bureaucracy in the administration of this program is ideal. One, again, because we're talking about streamlining, simplifying, and trust building, and having as few contacts with government as necessary is good for trust building. And second, because perhaps I'm being naive, but this seems like a pretty straight, administration of this program seems pretty straightforward. You know, give an agency some money and they give it to people. So um, I don't think that there's a great need for a lot of agencies and departments being involved. However, in terms of outreach and publicizing and community engagement, I would love to see as many agencies as possible drumming up this, um, this program and making sure that everyone across the state who could benefit uh, has, has heard about it and understands how to access it. I hope that helps. Yes, no, thank you. And I'm, it, just raises a question, it's a comment, not really something that I expect an answer is just, might there be a plan, might there be planning underway for that sort of outreach so that this can happen sooner rather than later? And um, I'm sure you all will be thinking about that. So um, thank you again. Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, I have uh, Dave and then back to Marty. Dave, are you? Yes, here? thank you. Thank you for all of your can you hear me? Yes. I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay. Thank you for uh, all of your hard work in this area. I had some questions from constituents over the weekend that I want to channel to you. Um, uh, I'll preface it by saying I want to help people strongly. Um, are there people in Vermont who are undocumented, uh, have no status, who are working, who will be benefited by this program? Yes. I want to make sure I, they, I understand. Are the question. they? You're asking. Well, if the, but behind it, it is not. A, will there be people who are here illegally getting assistance? That's what the question was, and I was trying to frame it in a kinder way, uh, but I didn't oh, want yeah. anything lost in translation. So forgive me for if I'm framing it in a harsh way. But there's a concern that there will be people getting assistance who um, are not here legally. Is that the case? Will they be helped? Yes. Is there, <laughs> do, do the we have yes. A, uh, yes, thank you. Um, may I continue a little bit, Madam Chair? Please, please. Yes, please. Okay. Um, do the people who are giving assistance have an obligation to report them? To report the people, the, the people who are here with no with unlawful status? Yes. I don't believe so. No. And and Vermont has taken great pains to clarify its role in enforcement of immigration law. So I think the state has demonstrated over the last couple of years on the whole that it does not intend to get involved where it doesn't have to on federal immigration policy. So I, barring another situation like what happened with DMV with the driver privilege card, um, I have no indication that the state plans to report the presence of Vermonters who are not here legally. And I mean, it would, it would work against the interests of the state to do so. So if someone is undocumented, has no social security number, there's no record of them, they're being paid cash, how, how will the grantee, the person giving out the money, know if you're working in Vermont? Well, or is that not the requirement? Does it matter whether you're working, if you're an adult? Correct, it's not a requirement because in the same way that the Federal CARES Act didn't have a requirement that a person be working, because you know the idea is everyone's suffering under this pandemic, whether you're employed or unemployed, whether you are wealthy or not wealthy, everyone's experiencing this. So we don't wanna put um, additional burdens on folks like work requirements. So yeah, the idea, and this is a feature, not a bug. The idea is that undocumented Vermonters would be included, that there would be no requirement that they be employed especially because the pandemic has upended a lot of people's employment opportunities. Um, and the idea is not to be in cahoots with immigration authorities. Okay, thank you. Uh, Marty thank you, and, Katie. Thank you, Dave and Marty. And then I have a question. Thank you. I'm very sympathetic to this program. I think we need to look after residents of our state. I understand that. I have kind of a quirky question. I think it's probably more for our appropriations committee than, than for you, Susanna, but I was intrigued by Chip's questioning about these residents who are working and who are paying payroll taxes. The pay, as I, if I understood it correctly, the, their portion of the payroll taxes is just going into the big pot. It's not necessarily so-called assigned to them so that they could not 
eventually file for a return on those taxes or eventually file for Social Security or eventually file for Medicare, as an example. So they're paying into the big pot, but not getting individual credit for those payments because they don't have a Social Security number. So my question more for the Appropriations Committee is, is there a way for the tax department to determine how much money that is and can we take the funds that we would like to return to these people from some tax account as opposed to from the general fund and that may be one and the same thing I don't know but I, I, I have a question for the tax department in terms of how we might be able to access funds there that are not specifically allocated to every other individual who has a social security number so, uh, Susanna, you probably could not answer that. But. No, I couldn't answer it concretely, but I would just like to tack on a bit of a caveat to it, which is that whatever portion of uh, tax revenue may be coming to the Fed or to the state from undocumented persons whose labor is generating those payroll taxes, it's not going to, it's not reflective of the total population of people who, who we're looking to serve here. And so if we were to recapture those funds in some way, it wouldn't be the entirety of, of what's needed for this population. Um, and you know, I, I would also just remind us all that there's tax contribution on the one hand that, that some are making, but there's also just the general contribution that they're making to our state economy. I mean, a couple million dollars is significantly less than what these folks are generating for the state. So in thinking about it in those mm -hmm. terms, I think it becomes a little easier to see the impact and the value. Okay, thank you. Um, we, we still can run uh, that question up the flagpole to the Department of Taxes, Marty, to see if there's any capacity there to build upon the governor's recommendation. Um, and uh, thank you. And Maria could help us uh, make that connection. Uh, Susanna, I do have a question um, just, you know, for, for folks listening and in the news that, that we keep the facts really clear and that assumptions are not made because assumptions are all right if they're based, you know, if, you know, if, if you can back them up with facts, but if they're just assumptions based on, well, the what ifs, then, then, you know, things often go in a very negative direction. And so one of my questions is, you know, the, the governor's proposal, if this is put forth, um, how do we uh, determine the population that we're working with um, and, and that we don't hear about people flooding to Vermont to take advantage of this program? Um, you know, what, you know, is there a time period set? Uh, what, what would you consider residency uh, versus a seasonal worker who's in and out of the state that just came here for a day or two and was visiting? How do we narrow the scope and get the facts out to individuals so that we don't, um, so it's not misinterpreted as just, you know, everyone come to Vermont and you get $1,200? Yeah, um, the residency requirement is a big one and it would follow the same well the proposal is that residency would be determined using the same criteria as outlined in the driver privilege um, statute so it's not necessarily saying oh you arrived here 12 hours ago here's 1200 dollars but saying you were considered a vermont resident when this pandemic was happening. And if in March, the federal government issued CARES Act payments to people and explicitly excluded folks like you, then, and, and I'm just spitballing here, so don't hold me to this, but I might venture to say that looking at the period around March or perhaps immediately thereafter, if you were in the state around that time, again, we're talking about parity and equity. So it may, it may make sense to look at the time period in question. Um, when COVID-19 upended everything. But I, and again, there's also gonna be a fixed amount of, a limited amount of time during which people can apply. So it's not gonna be three, you know, three years down the line and people are saying, I just got here a month ago, give me $1,200. Um, you know, it, it's 
supposed to happen now because now is when people need it. Thank you. And I look forward to us crafting, you know, if, if moving forward, if we move forward, how we craft that language so it's very clear and um, and eases maybe the minds of some individuals. Chip? Um, yeah, just to say uh, that in the draft proposal that we'll all be looking at a little bit later, um, it, it does, oh, sorry, my phone ringing. Um, it does try to um, address that question specifically um, uh, about what it means to be resident um, and specifically excludes people who are here for a, uh, a defined duration of time for a particular purpose. Like, um, for example, uh, you know, uh, my, uh, someone here is, who's like on an H2A visa to do apple picking, for example, they're here for a defined period of time um, with a specific purpose. Um, there are other examples, but, but it, we try to define residency clearly, but I think it's a good question and, and perhaps something we should think about, about whether we have established a date by which you had to have been resident in Vermont. And I think Susanna's suggestion of, you know, whether it's something related to um, the COVID period or, you know, some of the, the dates that we've been using about um, March or something might, might be worthwhile. Um, the other thing um, to Dave's, uh question which suddenly went oh about whether people um whether or not there i think it was dave uh, whether or not there would be requirements to report on someone's immigration status um, by agencies that are helping susanna answered it but it al is also clear in that draft legislation that that is not um that that they have to that information has to be kept um private essentially um I'll have a question about that for Ledge Council later, but um, just to say that those things are addressed in the draft and we can look at them in more detail. We have um, uh, from the administration some draft language um, and um, Chip has been, it has been working on this as well on his own to, to fully understand what that language would look like going forward. Um, uh, are there any other questions for Susanna? No other questions. Are you sure? I, I, we're hoping that um, as we work through this this piece within the budget um, that that was proposed to us, that we, that we can call on you for for assistance and your expertise in this area to to help us and. Um, in the in the governor's uh, proposal and 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 the the um, mechanism used to get the money out the door, I'm assuming that your position as a is as executive director that you would want to be involved uh, in this process. But I don't want to assume anything. I, I'm I'm asking you uh, what would you, what would your role be? That's what I should. I ask. would like to be very involved in this process. Absolutely. Um, we have two more questions, Mary and Dave. It's it's not a, que a question, uh, just a statement that I was very impressed that I saw the governor's proposal for this in our budget. And um, I'm really grateful that he put it forward. And I'm, I'm happy that we are talking about how to implement and expand this, this concept. Um, so, it, I mean, I know we have to have a committee discussion about how this goes forward, but I just wanted to acknowledge that the governor um, initiated the discussion and I'm looking forward to us helping him do this important work. Thank you, Mary. And Dave? Um, yes, D do, you, uh, do you imagine uh, should this pass and the dollars be available that these dollars will be dispersed rather quickly? I hope so, because if they're dispersed quickly, that means people are getting the help that they needed five months ago uh, quickly. I will say that um, we have written into the draft that any unused funds get returned to the general fund. And so I think instead of, one, instead of having them linger for a long time, we really would like to get them out the door quickly um, so yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can do it quickly. And I think that a lot of that will hinge on 
how many people affirmatively apply. And that's going to require a lot of on the ground legwork and very close collaboration with community groups to, to help spread the word and get those people applying. Yep. Couple of more questions. Um, you did you when you came up with your numbers, did you use some kind of an estimate for the number of people who would not apply? Does this include all everyone in your opinion, or did you say we I think 50% will apply? Can you speak well, to that? We, I absolutely can. Thank you for the question. We estimated up to 5,000 people who could be eligible. And if you do $1,200 per adult and $500 per child at that maximum of 5,000, you arrive at $5.3 million. But again, mm -hmm. that is the maximum and we have no idea if it is five, if it is that full 5,000 people and even if it is 5,000 people, how many will actually come forward? Because frankly, if I were at grave risk of deportation, then my anonymity might be more valuable to me than $1,200, which is a sad reality for a lot of people in this country, but this, yeah. is, the cost, this is the cost benefit weighing that people are doing. Um, but I will say that the proposal before you is for $2 million, and I would, I would ask that you consider, think of that as a floor and as the 5.3 as something of a ceiling. Um, we don't know if $2 million is about how much. It's, it's about half of the 5.3, so we don't know if that's yes. just right or higher or lower. It's, it's not clear, right. but I think to, to Representative Hooper's point, um, it, it is starting the conversation and, and this is kind of the level that, that we're looking at now, but just so that it's, it's on the record, the maximum numbers that we've estimated do bring us up to, to a higher amount than what's proposed, but we have no way of knowing if we would even reach that point. Sure. Yeah, uh, two so more sorry. questions, if I may. Do you believe it would be, pardon? I was just gonna add one more thing. Did I cut you off? Is, uh, I think I cut myself sure. off, I don't know. <laughs> um, the other thing that I, that I would just say to that is that, um, oh gosh. No, I've forgotten it. It'll come back to me. Please continue. It happens to us all the time, especially when sure. we're- I have No worries. <laughs> all the time. Uh, um, do you believe it would be morally sound to approach this by doing an appropriation now based on an estimate and then revisiting it? We have something called a budget adjustment process that you may or may not be familiar with, but revisiting this in January, and if you and others came in and said, boy, we were flooded. Um, we, were, we were really amazed by the, by the uh, uptake and the amount of interest, and um, uh, the money disappeared in a month, and there's still a need. Would you consider appropriating more? Is that another way of uh, approaching this? It's certainly an option. And if the need really was substantially greater than we estimated, then again, it would be the equitable thing to do to revisit it and try again to fill that need. And, and the thing that I was gonna say earlier, I just remembered it now, which is, you know, I've been saying that we don't, if it's really as high as we think it is in terms of the 5,000 people, but we're hoping that this exercise will also help us to capture more accurate estimates of who's here um, and will and will also bring bring people more into the light vis-a-vis -vis the state so that we can have real relationships with this population. And just one more, Madam Chair, if I may. Quickly. Yes, please. Um, did you does your estimate assume some amount of I guess the two million that you would uh, would go as an administrative fee to an organization that manages this? whomever it's granted out to. Do you imagine they're gonna need money to do this or is the infrastructure already in place and can all the dollars go directly in direct benefits? We wanna minimize administrative costs as much as possible. And that's one of the questions that came up. Do you administer this through a trusted nonprofit, a trusted third party entity, which can help to keep, um, keep an arm's length relationship with the federal government and also can help people be more trusting if it's not coming from the state directly. 
However, that does come with the possibility for that administrative cost that you're talking about. Compared to doing it in-house where we could probably use existing capacity and systems to, to handle that. So it's not, it's not firmly decided, but I guess to answer your point very, to answer your question very briefly, I would say we wanna pick an option that maximizes equitable distribution and minimizes administrative costs as much as possible. It would seem to uh, to develop and establish and promote the kind of enduring relationships that all people need, regardless mm -hmm. of their immigration status, that all children need to be nurtured and supported, um, using perhaps our existing networks that know those resources that can build trust and refer people to on an ongoing basis should they need it, has some value to it. I suspect, though, they're all overworked. <laughs> and um, but it's I'm going to think a little bit more on that. Thank you. Yeah, and and that's why partnership is so key here, right? The state can do A, B, C, and the advocates can do X, Y, Z, and when we put that together, is when you get the kind of coverage and overlap that that ensures better. So I'm I'm hoping that we can find some kind of a hybrid approach that utilizes um, the state and non-state actors to to rule this out. Susanna, we have four questions and we are at the 10 at the 11 o'clock hour. Do you have a few more minutes or are you, do you are you scheduled to be elsewhere? I am here for you. Well, we're going to hold you to that. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have Bob up next, uh, Representative Helm, and then I'll just work right around my Hollywood Square screen. <laughs> oh, wait. I, I want to start this by just saying that I, I do not disagree with this and with what I'm going to say next. I, I think it's a good thing to do. However, the stimulus that the federal government designed and put out was to, yes, help the recipients, but also benefit the economy. And I think it, I think it worked to some degree. This stimulus will help the recipients, but it will not help the economy very much. My people around here, transient workers, whatever you want to call them, the, when the week they get that check, they will be at the bank on Friday and they will wire that all to Brazil, Argentina, Mexico or wherever their family is. That's where all of their money goes. They keep pennies to live on and send it all home. I just want you, I just felt I needed to say that from my perspective, it won't help our economy. It will, most of it will be gone to other foreign countries. So that's all I have to say, thank you. Yeah, I think, I I thank you for that comment. And I would like to respectfully disagree. I think that it will help the economy, but perhaps not in the consumer spending way um, that we might be thinking of. Because when thinking about um, these are, most of these people are considered essential workers in our state, right? And so this is our way of stepping up and proving that we mean that. Um, and so I think helping our economy means helping the people survive who are upholding that economy, even if they're not necessarily spending that money at local ski resorts and fast casual restaurants. I think in some way it is having a measurable benefit to the state. And the other thing I'd say, because the question about remittances does come up in response to this sort of proposal. And I would say that, you know, again, we're talking about parity and equity and we didn't tell social security number holders you can't send your money to other people. We let people who received CARES Act money do what they wanted with it. And I think that it really is kind of the Vermont way to trust people to make decisions about what's best for them and their families. So if this time around, that means sending it back as remittances or using it for something else. Um, I, think, I think we owe it to, to every Vermonter to be able to make that choice without, without strings. And I know you're not suggesting strings um, but I, I just wanted to, to make sure that that got on the record. Thank no, you for the I, comment. 
I'm not even going to defend my position. I mean, I just wanted to bring this out. I still stand with what I said. Um, and I have, I'm going to vote. I'm going to support it. I presume I'm going to support it. Um, but anyways, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, let me move to Diane, and then we have Kimberly and Chip. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair and Committee. And, and I, too, would like to join Mary in thanking the governor for bringing this forward, because I don't believe it was um, as easier for him either. Um, and I appreciate him recognizing uh, the the, imp the uh, huge impact uh, in Vermont of this of, the, of this community that 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 has on our economy. But here's where my questions are, and, I'm, and I don't know. I'm, I feel like I may be asking you, Susanna, in, inappropriately. So I have questions around what are the next the next steps? Are we good? I'm I'm going to assume that. I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to have ask you to testify on some of the language that we have. I think that's for our ledge, our questions for our ledge council around the process and the way that it's written. So I'm going to save that for for that person. Same thing around the fiscal note for our, um, those questions for our JFO that are coming forward. But I have questions. I just want you to know what I'm carrying in my thinking is you know are you thinking that this is a first come first serve sort of a limited hard number of dollars or more of a, uh, an open-ended, let's see who applies and, and we adjust the budget towards that. Do you, do you have a, a position or a place where you're thinking that that would go as we're looking at the dollars? I'm gonna cop out and say, I think we should fund it to whatever degree meets the need and if what's on the table proposed is enough then great we may end up returning some funds to the general fund um and and if not i think this really gets that um rep yakovone's point which is it, it might be worth looking at again in the future but uh i'm, I'm coming dangerously close to surpassing my pay grade so i'll i'll leave it there Okay, thank, thank you. Diane, Diane, I'm going to jump in. I, I think that Susanna's given us a nice range that she gave us, you know, the, the two million that was on the, you know, the it's to get started, it's the the you know, it's the floor, and that the ceiling would be 5.3 with the numbers um uh that that we are are basing this on. So we do have a floor and a ceiling, and then it will be our job to determine where we go. Um, yeah, and we've been pretty flexible with other programs like we've seen in some of the business economic relief of seeing where it goes and and where it's needed and, and responding if it's if the need is higher than we thought or in the opposite direction. So I would see this similar. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Um, Kimberly, and then we'll finish up with Chip. Uh, thank you. Be it looks to me, Susanna, like this go. This does not require rulemaking. And just the one thing I want to say quickly, if there are situations where there are going to be differences, um, I would just flag uh, some consideration in of an appeals. I, I hesitate to find the right word, right? Adjudication, something like that, because um, better lay that groundwork now than than retroactively, particularly uh, given all the different um, factors in play. Thanks. Thank you for that suggestion. Thank you, Kimberly and Chip. Um, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll leave the discussion for, you know, sort of our thinking around how much funding we ought to be considering in this program for later. Um, as you say, Madam Chair, we, we have the rain. Um, but one of my, I'll have to say, one of my concerns um, about uh, the, the, the $2 million mark that's there now is, so if there is more demand, how do we, how, who gets the money? You know, if, do we simply put it out there until it runs out? Um, in that case, are there questions about who, you know who came forward first, and and does that get into things? You know, worries about 
those who are more concerned about immigration status <laughs> problems, that kind of thing. So uh, it'll all be part of the discussion later. But I did uh, want to ask Susanna if if you have a thought about this, um, given that if if we are able to fund it more fully and there's a potential that money would come back to the general fund, do you is there a would it be reasonable to think about putting in some kind of a um, a deadline for application that that people who who are going to apply for it need to have um, made that application by a certain date um, in order for us to the appropriations committee and the legislature to know how much of that money will be used and how much might be coming back to the general fund does that present any particular problems in your mind or um, is that something that if the committee was to discuss would would work Speaking for myself, I believe an application deadline would be appropriate. And about the question of whom do we prioritize if the need is greater than the uh, funding amount, I, we have, no, I have, and I'm not a mathematician, but I have run numbers, as much as a person who can't count can run numbers, um, about what it would look like if we did not have uh, funding that adequately met the need. And what I would recommend is that at the very minimum, we fully fund all applicants made, all applications made on the behalf of a minor. So if we believe there are up to 1,000 children in the state who, who would qualify, I would say that the first 500,000, because it's 500 per child, I would say the first 500,000, we, we should earmark for any child applicant. And that, and again, this is just my personal thinking and recommendation, um, and just sort of hold that, that first 500,000 for any child applicants. And then the remaining 1.5 could be prorated among any remaining adult applicants as needed, or done on a first come first serve basis at the full 1,200. But first come, first serve bases tend not to be equitable across the country for a lot of um, grant programs. So I think the state is going to be considering in the future moving away from that kind of model. model. But for now, I would just humbly recommend considering uh, earmarking that first 500000 for any child applicants. And then what's unused from that can go towards the adults. And then what's unused from that can go back to the general fund. Well, I, I, um, I, again, I will leave the greater discussion for later. I, I only brought up my concern about if, if we have more demand than there is um, application for exactly that reason that, that first come first serve seems to me to be a, a problem um, or potentially um, not the way I'd like to go. Let me just put it personally. Um, so. Um, but we can have that discussion later. I, I don't. I don't want to suggest by that um, that I'm unappreciative of, as other people have said, of the governor's putting this money in, and for whatever part you played in helping to get this on the table. Um, I, I, I am very appreciative, as it sounds like the rest of the committee is, that that it's in the budget and that we're able to have this discussion and think about how we move forward with it. So, thank you. Thank you. And and if I may, this was a sort of separate, but not really separate point which is, you know, the reason that we even have to do this and the reason that so many Vermonters are being pitted against each other for the state money is because of the strings that were attached to federal recovery funds. And so another big piece of this, and, you know, as we think about, well, what are we going to do if there's another round that's needed or if there, this doesn't meet the need, another big piece of it is all is the states advocating to the federal government that any future recovery packages have more flexibility so that we don't have to make trade-offs or, or treat, um, you know, treat recovery as if it's zero sum. Not to suggest that anyone here is treating recovery as if it's zero sum, but unfortunately we're having to make difficult decisions with state dollars um, because of the lack of flexibility in recovery funds. So, you know, I know that our, fellow, our federal delegation has been advocating fiercely for more flexibility for states so that we can accomplish these kinds of goals um, without, without so much difficulty, but, you know, this, this really is us picking up slack 
for the federal administration and um, but it doesn't it's not written in stone you know it's 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 a possibility that changes could be made with any recovery packages that come down from the Fed later on, in which case we may have a lot more options in the future if there is greater need or a need for a second round. Thank you, Susan. have one last hand up and I am going to make a hard stop after Dave. Dave, would you like to ask your question, please? Yes, I will. I'll, I'll try to be quick. Um, I don't necessarily support this, but I want to put it on the table um, because it could come up and I want to get your advice on it. Would you recommend, assuming if DCF said, you know, we have the capacity to issue EBT cards. And if you want to uh, give this benefit, I don't want to use the word as a gift card because that would sound charged in another way. But if you want to give this benefit in food, we'll, we'll uh, issue EBT cards. And that mollifies or weakens the argument that they're going to send the money home. How do you re respond to that? I think it's EBT for food. Yeah, um, it's certainly possible. And there's always a need for food, especially if you're me. But I think this is, that would be another way to limit the judgment of Vermonters who know what they need and how they could use those recovery funds by bottlenecking it into only food related spending. And that may not be the thing that they need to keep them afloat. Recovery looks different for all of us. And so, um, you know, if you gave me an EBT card for food, then I would be sitting in a room with 1700 pints of ice cream. That's how I would spend that. But I don't, I don't know that that would be a, an appropriate one size fits all strategy for people with normal appetite or other. Thank you. Peter, thank you. I'm, I'm breaking my own rules here, Peter. Thank you. So Dave just brought up an interesting point. Thank you for coming in, Susanna. So if you all of a sudden have a family of, of you know, three plus walking around with $2,400 husband and, and wife, $500 per child, let's say that's three, so that's $2,900 in cash. Um, I get uncomfortable if I've got more than about $100 in cash in my pocket. Uh, the safety aspect of, of having that amount of cash is what I wanna ask you about. And what are your thoughts? How can we help to ensure nobody's robbed or lose it or, or, you know, or other options and that EBT card where, and it doesn't necessarily, shouldn't just be for, for food only because certainly clothing and, and uh, you know, and some kind of housing is obviously also built, built into needs and there are other things that I can't think of right off the top of my head at the moment's notice. So I'll let you answer the question. Safety aspect, please. Yeah, thank you for the question. And I would say respectfully representative we are well past safety concerns for a population that is being literally hunted by ICE. Um, I think carrying cash is probably the least of, of, of their worries. And I would also say that one thing that we could do to address the structural inequity issue here is to help this population get access to banking. This is, this is often an unbanked population. And so thinking about how can we get people access to financial services that they can trust um, so that they don't have to worry about cash under the mattress or in stock is, is, is a more meaningful intervention um, than, than putting it in card form this time around. Certainly our, our system of community banks might be of, of assistance, but I, I haven't opened an account in a long time. I would tend to think that they would need a social security number. I don't know if an I-10 would, would, would qualify, but you know, barriers everywhere and we got to work through them. So thank you. Thank you, Peter. And Maida? Um, I, I'm sorry, thank you, Kitty. I'm sorry. But, sorry. And I want to say um, to, to my colleagues on the committee, um, I really, really appreciate all the questions that have been asked and to try and double check this piece and that piece and the next piece. Uh, that's meeting our responsibility in terms of the committee. I just want to add 
this observation that is burning inside of me, the population that um, is the focus of, of this um, legislative proposal, they've already been treated differently once. The folks who did receive, one, one could have some of the same concerns uh, which have been articulated with regard to any number of Vermonters who who, who were allowed to receive the up to $1,200 by the federal government. Um, and, and these various restrictions were not placed on them. So I, I would just, in, in my own mind, I, I'm just hoping that we don't get into treating uh, the, the population at issue with this proposed legislation yet again differently. Yeah. It, it, it feels bad to me, even though we're not trying to be disrespectful. I get that. Thank you, ma'am. Susanna, thank you very much for coming in. This information has been helpful, and I, I'm sure as we move through, we're going to uh, need you at the table uh, with, your, with your thoughts and expertise. What I would like to transition to, you're more than welcome to stay in the, um, in the committee and hear this. I've asked... Um, the Joint Fiscal Office, when we saw the proposal to prepare a um, fiscal note on the governor's proposal so that we would know the, ho the whole range of cost. And it's, it's within your floor to ceiling, but I, we needed um, an official fiscal note to move forward. And so uh, Nolan Langwell is here uh, to present his work and his fiscal note on, on, the, on the proposal as proposed by um, Governor Scott's um, budget. So Nolan, um, Susanna, did you already leave? Did she leave? Oops. I'm nope. still here. I'm with you in spirit. Oh, you just, you just, okay. Uh, you're welcome to stay. And again, I wanted to th say thank you. So now thank we're going you to- Thank you all. Uh, thank you. Uh, Nolan, um, let's talk, uh, walk through the fiscal note. And Teresa, if you could put that up, that would be helpful. Um, for the record, Nolan Langwell, the Joint Fiscal Office. Um, if there may be a few typos, so forgive me, I, I had to make some changes on the fly um, moments ago. Uh, so if, if folks printed it out an hour ago, you'll see that there are some small changes. Hang on, uh, I had to repost it, so I just got to grab it again. Yeah. Um, the other thing I'll say is I can make this pretty quick because I think that one, Susanna did a really um, good job, thorough job of walking folks through the proposal. And two, I think a lot of the pieces that are in my fiscal note came out through the members' questions. So I think I will uh, move through this relatively quickly, but I think a lot of this has sort of been discussed. So again, this is the administration's proposal. Um, Teresa, oh, oh great. Awesome. So it would basically, this, pro this proposal it would establish a Corona Relief Assistance Program for immigrants. And to be eligible, you have to certify that you're a resident of Vermont and are eligible or, or were ineligible for to receive economic impact payments under the Federal CARES Act due to immigration status. As already been discussed, it's $1,200 per eligible adult and $500 for each eligible child. Um, and it's estimated that it would be, it would, um, it would affect about 3,500 to 4,000 adults and about up to 1,000 children. Now, what I'll say about that is I spent some time talking to Susanna and looking through their methodology. And I feel like this is as reasonable and fair of an estimate as there is. Um, they showed me several, they provided me all their sources and I reviewed the sources and in no way did they ever pick the highest. They always were very um, thoughtful and where in the ranges that they picked. So I feel like they did a really good job, very reasonable job of providing how many people we think are affected. Again, it's. It's, we don't know, and it's from various sources from various years. Um, so we're just, it's, it's the best that can be done to figure out the amount of people at this moment. Um, in that estimate, there's 3,000 undocumented adults, approximately 250 of which are folks that work in the dairy industry. There are 500 citizens and legal permanent residents. These are green card holders uh, who file taxes with undocumented spouses zero to 500 immigrants with lawful status but do not have a social security number. So this would be folks 
would this examples would be uh, people with student visa holders, asylum applicants, uh, others who are waiting for their uh, asylum authorizations, um, spouses and or dependents who have been petitioned by citizens, etc. Um, Nolan, um, I want to just interrupt. Teresa, could you um, move the, uh, the, the, thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you. And then estimate between 500 and 1,000 children. Um, these estimates are consistent. And then, then they had another piece which they, they looked at, they provided a Pew Research Center report from 2016. And, and this, their estimates in the aggregate were very consistent with the Pew Center estimated as well. So again, I'll just say that I think that these are fair and reasonable estimates as there are at the moment. Um, and based on those numbers, the estimate fiscal impact would be between 4.5 million and $5.3 million a year. And as was discussed, the governor's uh, budget restatement proposes appropriating $2 million of general fund for this program, which is less than half that will be needed. And Teresa, can you go to the next page? So things to keep in mind that would impact the estimate, and this was, again, this came up in conversation, was the take up, which is how many people will take up the program. Um, and again, this gets to, um, I think a lot of it will depend on how the program is administered, and that gets to the complexity of the application process, how well the outreach program go is, um, and then also how much the trust there are is in the intended uh, of the by the intended beneficiaries for the state and or the administering program. So, the conversation about how uh, many people we think will apply, I think a big part of that will be. Um, how is the program administered? Who is administering it? And how well did they get the word out? Um, and another piece that I think uh, Representative Yacobone brought up, Yacobone, um, was that, you know, whether to the extent that the program partners with any private entities to assist with the administration, there could be additional administrative costs. Now, Susanna said that obviously would be the, the the goal would be to have as little uh, administrative cost as possible, but we'd be remiss if we did flag that as an issue. So that's the fiscal note in a, in a, in a pinch. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions that, that haven't already been asked, I think, um, but if there's questions. Uh, thank you, Nolan, for walking us through the fiscal note. And I would ask uh, committee members, I think a great deal of the questions have been answered. Uh, but if there's specific questions related to the fiscal note, uh, this is a good time to ask Nolan. Uh, Representative Lanfer. You are muted, Wait, Diane. There we go. Um, thank, thank you, Nolan, for, for this. I know, I know you're very, very busy. Um, if I'm recalling the $2 million that the governor recommends, it is one-time dollars. It's not ongoing, obviously, but, and then um, I'm trying to remember if it was, if this is in um, FY20, one-time dollars is the 2 million. Maybe that's not a fair question to ask Nolan. Well, I think you could ask, I think you could. It's, um, it's in the governor's restatement budget for fiscal year 21. So would be a 21 thing. And I, I would assume that this is a one time, uh, one just time. federal CARES Act money was one time. Yep. Okay, thank you. This would be a one time appropriation. Um, we would have an application, um, well, we would consider an application deadline uh, so that it didn't um, go into 2030. Um, but that's all discussion that the committee will have. Um, I wanted to um, just state for Susanna before she leaves uh, that we did take some testimony um, last week from, from uh, Commissioner Gresham, and um, it was uh, considered by the administration whether this should go into the budget or whether it would move as a separate bill. Ultimately, the administration put it into the budget for consideration. Our committee talked about this yesterday not yesterday, Friday or Thursday or Friday of last week. And uh, we had, um, we had, I, we took a, a, a vote around, uh, around the screen here that uh, it would be the desire of this committee to move it out of the budget and move it as a separate bill. 
And at this point, um, I'm, I'm considering, uh, not considering, I'm assuming that that position has not changed from the committee and we would go ahead and move this as a separate bill. I'm looking for nods of heads or is there any opposition to that? I should ask, does any, has anyone changed their mind about that? Okay, so we will move it as a separate bill. And as we start, um, we, we have the governor's language to work from. And as we start working on our own language, uh, the fiscal note would uh, be representative of the language that we will bring forth before for the committee unless we made some radical changes and no one needed to update that language or revise it. Um, any final questions now? We do have, um, I, I see Commissioner Gresham has joined us. Uh, are there any final questions um, for the executive director of the program or for uh, Commissioner Gresham? Sorry, Adam, that's what happens when you show up or for the joint fiscal office with the fiscal note. And if not, we'll move into con committee discussion. Good morning, all. Good morning, uh, uh, Adam. It's always nice to see you. Well, I'm not seeing you yet. I'm just seeing a blank, a blank square with your. That busy. Okay, I would like to move there to. There you go. I would like to thank, thank you, Adam, and thank you for your clarification uh, last week regarding the proposal and um, and with your thoughts talking about whether it's a budgeted item or whether it's a, a bill item. And we have made the decision to move it as a separate bill. So thank you for um, your work and bringing in this to us and to the governor for putting this proposal forward. Um, we thank the executive director, Susanna Davis for her work in this critical legislation. And Nolan, thank you for your work uh, to provide us with a timely um, you guys are just working like crazy in legislative council and in the fiscal office, just getting this, this information we need so quickly and we appreciate it. Um, not just the timely work, but the incredibly good work that you do. So I would move to committee discussion and uh, we have about 30 minutes, to take a break at noon. And when we come back, I do wanna get back to our budget, you know, to the budget. So I would like to, uh, shape this up uh, with the format we will move uh, forward with. And uh, so that work can, can start with legislative council. Um, so with this bill, there were some uh, pieces that um, the committee members brought up. There were pieces around uh, whether there's an application deadline. Uh, there was a piece uh, regarding um, any unused funds, where they would revert to, what we would do with that. I think, Marty, that was your question. Chip, I think you had the application deadline um, uh, comment. There's been comments around um, restricting uh, the use of the money or, or, you know, does the committee want to think about uh, EBT cards or, or like provisions or uh, MEDA? I think you talked about, um, you know, rolling it out as we did or as the federal government did with the stimulus package that went out back in March to, um, to individuals. Um, so let's start with those pieces and so that legislative council, we can give them some, um, some information about the direction our committee would like to take. Uh, Bob, I see your hand is up. Would you like to start? Yeah, I don't know, maybe you covered it and I missed it, but how about if there's more demand than there is money allocated. It would be um, what we do with um, anything else. If there's more demand in reach up or with any program, um, they come, uh, whoever it is that's in charge of that program comes back to budget adjustment and pleads a case. Um, it, the, the one difference with this program is uh, there would be um, a, a deadline to have your application in. And so once that deadline hits, you know exactly the number you're working with. But with other programs um, that are ongoing, you, you know, know. The application date. So um, maybe that's where we want to start with is um, with the application process. Uh, Susanna has said that she, you know, she wants to be intricately involved um, with this process, but let's talk about um, a, a deadline for the application, which uh, she did, I wrote down under her name, she feels that is appropriate. What are members feeling about an application deadline? 
like some thumbs yes. any thought any any there should be a deadline yeah uh, are there bob you have your blue hand up october there. one oh i i say there's a should be a deadline i didn't that's not why i had my hand up though sorry i'm gonna put it down there <laughs> Um, um, so the, the, I think that there's agreement that there should be a deadline and, um, and let's talk about that deadline. Marty, you have your hand up and I think you put out um, a date. I threw out October 1st. Okay. So that is one month from today. Um, I, 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 I appreciate the date and I'm not pushing back against the date. I, I would need to October learn. October 15th. Yeah, I'm just thinking how long it's going to take to, to get this out and get the awareness out and whether the program would open right. and close almost on the same day. Uh, so, Can I, uh, is Marty, is that date to set up or to apply? Apply. I was thinking of it as an application date. But I agree with Kitty, that's probably yeah. too short by the time we get our legislation done and we get some agency to actually set it up. But I, I think the idea is we want to have it right away. And I'd say October 15th or you know, November 1st, if that makes it more reasonable. But the date to actually learn enough about it and actually get your application in by November 1st. Okay, so we have a... Yeah. a first, which I think that in fairness, we would run that by Susanna. But, uh, you know, if we could act quickly, we did hear in, in testimony from Susanna, they want this money to go out quickly. And, and so it's not something they want right. to do a lot. Yeah. Um, Kitty? I have Maida and then Mary. Yeah, yeah. Th thanks, Kitty. Um, I, I uh, want to um, weigh in that I think November 1st is better than any earlier because this has to go through the other chamber. You know, it, it might be the very end of September before this is signed off on. And I think okay. so November 1st, I think is so number November 1st is 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 a reasonable kind of time frame. Thank you, Maida. Um uh, oh, Kimberly, I'm sorry. Dave, and then Diane. Yeah. I'm sorry. Right. Well, just Thank Just you. Oh, sorry. I think that as we think about this whole bill, we should keep stay focused on keeping it as simple as possible. They, we don't need any level of complexity to it. Uh, on this topic, I would suggest that we simply say that there is a deadline uh, for getting it out and let the people who are administering the program figure out what the right deadline is. I mean, we could say as soon as possible, which is so mealy mouthed. I know it's an uncomfortable thing, but I just, I, let's keep it simple. I'm very concerned about a deadline that is either too short or too long. And I don't know what the right number, wh where it is, which is the reason I'd rather give it to the folks who may know more than we do. Thanks. And Susanna may be able to guide us on that, what she, what she thinks would be um, uh, a, a good, whether it needs to be, uh, I mean, because we don't know when the bill, you know, will ultimately end up being passed and signed and then the, the whole uh, process being set up. And so whether there needs to be some more um, flexibility there or if she, if she has a date in mind uh, that she could help guide us with. Um, and, and she did, Mary, to your point, talk about simplifying the form, that that was going to be key. Um, the $1,200 that came into other Vermonters and, and, and um, people around the country, there was no form. Um, there was just a check that yeah. Uh, um, who, um, let me see, I don't know who was next. Linda, I'll go to Linda and then Dave. And Kimberly after that, Linda. Thank you. Thank you, Kitty. I am very much in favor of a deadline for having the form, not just leaving it for someone to decide at some point in time. So if the November 1st, I was in favor of Marty's first October 1st, but I was willing to be uh, changed to, the, to November the 1st. But 
in regards to what you just said about that $1,200, for that $1,200 that originally came out to all citizens, that went out. And there's no way, I mean, there, there, it, it, you, you looked at the, at the, the social security numbers, you looked at their tax payments and it, and it went out. We don't have that opportunity with this, which is why I feel that we really need some kind of a specific deadline date. And, you know, November 1st works for me, um, uh, just because I think there's enough time for the state to get, get its act together and, and, and then move on from there. And while I've got the screen here, uh, one more thing to say is that I really feel this should come definitively from the state of Vermont, not from another organization that we move it to. Um, this should come from the, the, the governor's office or from the House of Representatives or the state of Vermont or the legislature, but not assigning it to another, even a nonprofit or something like that to move this out. This is, this is coming from the legislature. This is coming from the governor and that's how it should go out. Thank you. And you're saying using um, a government agency to put the money out and not a third party. Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, I went to Kimberly next and then to Dave I'm, and I'm just trying to, I'm losing track of who I say first. I'm, I apologize. <laughs> Uh, just super quick, one consideration, Linda, I appreciate your point, but I think this is going to involve multiple languages and so on so that it doesn't fall flat and so the outreach is meaningful. And I don't know what the capacity is for the state of Vermont. And I'm thinking about some recent experiences uh, in elections around that, but I take your point. But uh, And I also agree with Mary about leaving the details, but uh, I would be comfortable with the deadline only if it allowed a really robust outreach program that was carefully considered for the populations that we are trying to reach. So that if there is a lower uptake, it's not because the outreach was inadequate. Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, Dave and then Diane. Yes, um, I'm, I'm listening and I want to be open uh, to all, all ideas. Uh, I should say though, right now, I've not been persuaded uh, at all as to why there would be a deadline on assistance. To me, this is, this is humanitarian aid. Why, why would I have a hard, fast deadline and not provide assistance to someone? Why, why would I say to people whose lives that I cannot relate to, but I read about and I try to empathize with, um, I'll never know what it's like to be worried to go to Walmart and have somebody take me away from my family. I'll never worry what it's like to have to live underground and to be hidden. Um, uh, so I, I think it will take time for the networks that exist or that will emerge to convince people to be helped. And if a deadline is intended to help us for accounting purposes, um, I'm not quite persuaded uh, by that. Somebody wants to put a deadline that's reasonable on government standing up a program within a certain period of time. I probably uh, could support that. Um, uh, Linda raises a good point about whether it should be the state or not. I think many fear the state, um, uh, but uh, there are network organizations who might have the relationships to persuade people to step forward and but go to a state office to receive assistance. That is a scary thing for many people. So I, I don't want to be redundant. I'll stop there. I just, I just worry that people who desperately need help um, might, might be denied with a hard deadline. And that, that gives me pause. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Diane, and then we'll move to Chip, then back to Linda. Oh, good, because I wanted to respond to, I wrote down, Dave, my my feeling on a deadline was, was exactly what you said. It's a deadline on us. We've seen, whether it's in the CHINS program or in the uh, substance use disorder program, where five and seven million dollars have sat for years, and not not that there wasn't good work around trying to get it done, but that was my concern around a deadline is more about 
getting getting to the point where maybe or my feeling would be committee is that we get to a deadline for when we start outreach so that they have some yes. time built in so we want to be as soon as possible to be able to start outreach and then there's a window of time whether we have to define it or not that outreach occurs while taking applications and then on the other end, we could ask just like we've done in these other bills, which by the way, off topic, the Meals on Wheels report that I finally read yesterday is fabulous. But that's that's a check-in report of, hey, we gave you money, what's going on with this? And are we meeting the goals of where we wanted to reach? So I would look for a check-in, kind of just a two pager of like what's happened, how many people are applied, where's the grant gone. I don't have a problem with it going through AHS and if they want to grant out some of this, but AHS will have to be the one throat to choke on this, so to speak. Um, so that was where some of my thinking was, is that I would want to move as quick as possible to that they've got the program ready to go to outreach and then I don't know about a deadline on the other end, but I, I wouldn't want it to be eight months. I'd want it to be shorter than that. Um, that uh, I'll stop talking. I, 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 just, I just want to clarify with the committee, a deadline means is this an open-ended program that we will, we will fund for years and years and years, or is this parity to the 1200 that went out for stimulus to COVID-19? And so we need to define exactly what we're doing. Um, the, 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 pro, the program that's brought to us from the governor is parity to the COVID-19 expense. Um, and, and so um, I, I, would, um, I would be a, a little hesitant to create a, a program that goes on forever without it going to a policy committee. That would be a January issue and rate to a policy committee because appropriations does not make ongoing programs. Uh, we have been uh, appropriating CRF money. Those are not available for this for this group of people. And so, you know, if we're looking at something more than addressing the COVID-19 $1,200 parity and 500 for children, that that is going to have to be a, a go out to the committees of jurisdiction. So we have to think about that, which then does push out the 1200 um, because it, then it becomes a different program than what's in front of us right now for a budget committee to uh, consider. Um, I have no idea where I am with hands. I think this was to Linda next and- Oh, um, Chip. Uh, Chip, okay, Chip and then Linda, and then I'm not gonna get ahead of myself. I'm gonna then call on you one at a time, Chip. Well, I'll be very brief because Kitty, you've just said pretty much what I was going to say. I, I, I want to say first, I, I really appreciate Dave's sort of way of viewing this, um, and and I think that's that's incredibly important. Um, but but this is a a, a, a sort of a one-time program to get that money out the door to those people in the same way that stimulus. Um, money went out um, and and therefore I think needs to be limited in its in the time period that it that it um, can take it's not an ongoing program as as I think you know it would be lovely to be able to consider and that and that sort of addresses the the view of it that Dave has I think um, but but for me this is a one-time program that needs to get out the door and and you know there's a fiscal like it or not, there's a fiscal aspect to that, which um, part of which is that we're asking, we're going to be asking some agency to administer it. I don't think we want to ask them to take on that burden for any longer period of time than, than is necessary. They need to know kind of the, the scope of their, the work that they're going to have to do. Um, and um, as much as, you know, again, we hate to have to say it, if there's money left over that this doesn't isn't going to go out because people are unwilling to apply for it or whatever. We should know that sooner rather than later, so that that money can go back into the general fund to support other programs that are important that we all care about that that could also do uh, important humanitarian type work. So. Thank you, Chip. Um, Linda. 
Yeah, I just wanted to, to clarify the statement that I made about having a deadline. That mm -hmm. a deadline that I was look, talking about, whether it's November 1st or whether it's October 15th or whatever, was for the application, not that people should have already, a, will, will have received their money. So it has to, pro, the program has to start up. And so I would like to give the, you know, the administration and the, and the state the opportunity to put this program together so that the people that want it, get it, or have the opportunity to get it and have that ready by say the, that by November 1st. And that's when people can start applying for it. So that was just a clarification I wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Uh, Peter? Thank you. So I think I've, in my own mind, I now have three deadlines here that are I hate to call them deadlines, but three time frames that we need to be looking at. The first of which is the date that, that people are residing here in the state of Vermont for which they will be eligible for, for this. And I'll put on the table the dates February, March, and April uh, of, of calendar year 2020, uh, that if they were residing here and fell within one of the parameters as identified in uh, Susanna Davis's document, that they would then be eligible for that that uh, so th that would then take care of the time frame that we're looking at and then the uh, the date to stand the program up linda's is as good as any um the date by which they should apply we can either use the budget document itself which which um, which finishes uh 30 june of 2021 as the date by which they must apply or we can bring it for bring it uh, backwards a little bit to the uh, march april time frame of next year which would give folks a full year to, uh, to apply for this uh, if they were here in, in residence at the time and work it from there. So we really have three dates that we have to, I think, look at here. Can I, can I comment on that? That's great, Please. Peter. Love it. Can I just, I like the part of the April, May, that end date. It allows us that we still have the budget. So if there's unused funds, it comes to us before yep. our budget adjustment is out the well the maybe budget adjustment or the budget next year is out budget. the door. yeah peter um and i can you i want to write uh can sure. you uh restate quickly so, what so, you so again again three dates that, that i think we need to be looking at one is the date where they were residents in the state of vermont and because um, the uh, the original intent of why the rest of us received funding was was because of COVID, um, I'm looking at the because of COVID, um, and I just right off the top of my head said February, March, April. March is kind of the date when it really went wham, uh, but uh, February was the lead in, and and um, and April certainly hurt. Or you can do March, April, May. So, or you can do all four. Uh, but just that time frame for residency, you know, that they are residing here in the state, that would be the first. The second, Linda's, you know, to get the to get the program stood up. Um, sometime in, uh, you know, late October or November, I, I think would be very appropriate. Um, as we have said, needs to be very simple. So it shouldn't be difficult to get it stood up. Uh, and then the date by which um, is the, you have to apply for it by this date. Um, because this is a budget document, we can say through 30 June. That's, and that's it. Or we can move it forward a little bit and say I would time it. Actually, my preference would be the same time frame one year later from the date of uh, that they are residing here. So if we're going to use February, March, April, I would say end of month April of next year. If we're going to use January, February, March, I'd say end of month March next year. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Sure. Uh, Marty and then Mary. Well, I. I can agree with the date of residence and the date to stand up the program, but I would certainly think we want people to actually apply and therefore disperse money much sooner than next March. I would, if we allow them to start applying on November 1st, I would think we want to start, we want to have a deadline of when they have applied by December so we can start sending money out the door. If we don't put a deadline on the application that means it's totally open and we're going to be doing the first come first serve situation if we want to prorate it if we think we may have to then you're going to have to know what your pool of people is 
so you can prorate it before you start sending money out the door. I, I, I thought the intent was to get money out as quickly as possible. And it would seem to me if we had a hefty outreach program, I agree, we need that. But we would ask people, we would have it available to apply for by, by the 1st of November. And people would have four weeks to think about applying and actually get an application in by December rather than stretch it way out and and again then we're stuck with the first come first serve and not knowing whether there's enough money or not mm. that's, so, very, that's a good point with other grants that we've put out we don't start putting out the money until like you know with the dairy or the forestry or the loggers and then the money goes out after the applications are in so we have to think about it. <clears throat> extend it to March. Do we dribble the money out, or do we wait until the end of March and then all the money goes no, out? We dribble it. We yeah, we send it out. Oh. Peter. Oh, Kitty. Uh, and and I agree with what what Marty said. But what I'm doing is is thinking about the trust piece here. Yeah. Um, what I would anticipate yep. some to many individuals will do is they're going to wait and see. What happened to what happened? to you know someone else I know who is applying for this early? Let me see if anything bad if he's here you know next yeah. month or did somebody come and take him away that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I think that we need to to give it enough time such that it it and of itself will build enough trust in people so that they will actually apply. Hence my reasoning for saying let's give it a year. I know that that means it's going to go out dribbling, but if folks decide. I'm, I could really use the funds now and I'm okay enough with it, I'll go apply. Can I? Marty, I just one minute, Diane. I think that this, these are the questions that we don't have the expertise. We, we don't, we don't know. Right, the right, we don't. This is, where, this is where Susanna Davis's office, we, we mm -hmm. signed yep. that office to help us answer these questions. And so I would suggest, Chip, that you bring all of these questions about you know the you know the res the date of uh, that you had to have residency here in Vermont, um, and then the date to get a startup program, and then um, the date to apply by, and you know do we restrict or not restrict that date or put the funds out? Uh, Peter brought up a point where you know I'll let my neighbor apply and see what happens, and if it works yeah. out, then okay, I will. Or you know, people may be so desperate right now; they need the money now, and uh, we don't want to put barriers to get get it rolling as fast as we can. So instead of us trying to guess what it should be, uh, Chip, would you bring all of these questions uh, back to Susanna, and then we could have her back into the committee uh, to help uh, to help w walk through some of our concerns, and then we can make better decisions uh, once we hear from her and the communities. Um, let's see, I have um, Mary next and then Chip, Bob, Ma um, Marty. Thank you. And no, no. I, I agree that we need to ask advice on how to do this. I, I would like to suggest that taking the question of whether or not you were a resident way back when off the table I think what matters is that you were a resident when we began offering this service, not what were you doing back then, because what we care about is who is in the state right now who is in trouble and how do we give them help. Um, we know that if you say if you were a resident by September 1st, for example, you have not, you didn't move here to well, we'd have to figure out the date so that you wouldn't move here to take advantage of the program. I hear, I presume that's the issue that you're addressing, Peter, by suggesting no, no. a beginning no. date? No, no, okay. no. I don't think it matters when you came here as long as you are here. And that's what, those are the folks that we need to offer this opportunity to. I agree that we do not want to pass something into law and then have people move here to take advantage of it. That's a different question than were you here in March? Can I, I respond to that? Diana can help with that as well. Diana, yeah. Diana, I'm sorry, not Diana. 
It's all right. There's, I answer to almost anything that starts with me. Um, so I, the only reason, well, the reason I would track back, Mary, that I, I don't disagree with you totally, but if we're trying, if this program is a, not a new program, it's just in response to the fact that these people were left out of a program that the Fed set up, that the rest of us were able to benefit from. So we're trying to parody it to that program that it was, you know, a specific point of, of time, right? So um, I was somewhere in the United States at some date and I was eligible for the federal program. Why shouldn't I be eligible for this one that you're trying to make? So Somewhat. you're thinking that being a resident of Vermont is not as much of a requirement as a resident or have been in the United States? Now, I'm, I'm just trying to say that we didn't have residency. We didn't restrict people when they got the federal money. We're, I don't think we would restrict people no. who didn't receive the federal money. That's all, I was just trying to draw. I don't think residency in March in Vermont is particularly relevant. The question is, do you have a need today that was not met in the past? Except yeah, and I'm trying to also think about, and I, I know they're having discussions tough on, on Zoom, of like some of the programs that we set up for relief in the business community, had you had to be in business within this time frame. Of course, we were talking very specific COVID relief dollars. Yeah. You know, and we also and saw... Think about all the problems we saw with that. Right. Yeah. Forty nine percent instead of fifty. You know, et cetera. So I'm going to move to okay. Bob yeah. now. Bob, you have a question or a comment? Oh yeah. Um, wow, this goes back a ways, but you know, I don't know who, what types of people y'all are talking about. The ones I have here come in and they're hired in, whether it's 10 of them, 15 of them, or whatever it is, to a farm, to a quarry, to a business. And that employer is going to deal with this for them. The employer is going to step right up and say, hey, guys, here's what I got for you. And he's going to walk them through it. He's going to do that within 24 hours of finding out that it's available. In my, in my world, anyways, none of them are in financial trouble. They, they don't have any money anyways, because as I said earlier, it goes home every Friday. They'll, they'll run from the slate quarries. They run a bus up to the bank. You can watch them march right out of their single file right into the bank and out the other door. So, you know, I maybe you've got other types of people wandering around the state that are not under uh, an umbrella of that nature, but I sure don't. That's that's the only type of folks I have. These, these guys will be guided and the employer will do it because it's going to make him look good and, and he wants his guys to get as much money as he, he can. I mean, they were getting... I know the Brazilians were getting 12 bucks a day and now they're getting 17 bucks an hour. They're wealthy people anyways, in their own eyes. And if they can throw another 12 in their pocket, their employer is going to look like a, a real great guy to them and everybody will be happy. So I, I, I think it's a great thing for my, my people, but I, I can't imagine anybody could, could lose on it. But anyways, I've said my thing. And I will be Kitty. quiet now so you all can have lunch. Kitty, so recommendation? Have... Yes, Peter. So Susanna Davis can help us answer yes. all of our questions. And, and otherwise, we're just going to continue to discuss, discuss, mm -hmm. discuss, discuss, yeah. discuss, and not end up anywhere <laughs> other than missing that's, lunch. That's where, that's where I'm going. But I want Chip to <laughs> be able to wrap up because I'm giving Chip a lot of pieces yes. to do. But yes. what I want to yes. say to the committee is, we have a proposal from the governor to find parity in a program that came out from the federal government. If we are going to move this into a larger or different type of program, it needs to go to the committee of jurisdiction. If we're, if, if we, so, so we just, we just really need to decide as a committee, is this something that we feel that we can work with 
and take, um, uh, you know, we, we need to hear from Susanna and, and Chip, has, and I see that she's joined us, but because we're at the noon time and we've been sitting here for two hours, we do need to take a break. <laughs> During this break, I, I want you to really think, you know, there's all sorts of questions about the little bits of detail and, and what it should be. Um, I, I, Chip is going to bring our questions and is our focus on the proposal brought to us by the governor for parity, for money that went out and, and to address Vermonters who were left behind for that issue, or if it's something larger, if it's, if it's the parity issue from the budget, our committee can move forward with it. If it's something larger that individuals are looking for, it leaves our committee and it goes to the committees of jurisdiction to take full testimony and it becomes probably a January issue unless we want to be here in October. Okay, so Chip, um, you get the final words and then I'm not going to, I'm not moving after Chip because it's afternoon and then we're going to come back and work on the budget. Yep. Um, thanks. You, you again have covered pretty much what I was going to say and I, I will um, forward our questions to to Susanna. Um, I, the one about residency, um, when we discuss um, a, a um, draft, I, I think that's probably the place to discuss that. Um, I, I think there are some real questions that have been brought up here that we're going to have to nail down. I know how I am thinking about it, but um, maybe, maybe I could suggest that we wait uh, to discuss that um, when we get to the draft of the bill. And you've heard some questions. And so if you could take these to Susanna and, um, and if committee members want to weigh in with you directly offline and uh, you bring a first draft of a bill for us to then, to then work with. I do want to remind the committee though, um, we have to work through this thoughtfully and carefully and really responsibly, but we have a budget that we have to have all decisions made by Friday. If this is going to be a second bill addressed by this committee, all work, we have to be done by Friday as well. Otherwise, uh, it, 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 doesn't have, it doesn't have the time. So um, keep your the time frame in mind. And Maida, I'm sorry, but I did say I was going to stop with Chip, and so we will catch up with you. Um, I'm sorry. Otherwise, I know it will be another question and another question. I would like to come back at 1.15, um, and uh, I want to um, go through some more of the web report language and um, uh, new, langu if new languages, if, if anyone has any, and also our language um, uh, that's existing to close out pieces. And then at the end of the day, um, we, we may come back to this bill. But if you have specific thoughts, get them to Chip and he's going to be in touch with Susanna and Legislative Council. And we should have some sort of draft legislation that we can uh, take a uh, start working on tomorrow. Okay. Okay, that was actually kind of fun, Madam Chair, to have a little policy. I know, but if we go we into don't get policy, it's going to the policy. We don't do that. <laughs> okay, I think we can go offline, Teresa, and we'll be back at one fifteen. <laughs> 